Good morning, everyone. Uh, something that Jim left out um, was uh, my first client when I started the firm in 1978 uh, was the AART, which is now the AARC. Uh, many of you uh, uh, might have known uh, Cheryl Brown, Cheryl West. Uh, I hired her, and then uh, Sam Giordano hired her away uh, uh, from me. So my history with uh, AARC goes uh, 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 way back uh, uh, into the 1970s. And um, uh, I married a respiratory therapist uh, who is now a global VP for a software company. So. For those of you who are interested in moving on, the possibility does exist. Um, and uh, uh, I made a major mistake um, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, January 1st, it appears I'm going to start as executive director of the California Society for Respiratory Care. Uh, so uh, uh, respiratory uh, is very much in my blood, very much in our office's blood. It uh, has many causes that we uh, 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 strongly believe in. And I assume I just do page down? Yep, page down. Got it. Got it. All right, see, we are educable. There we go. Um, uh, one of the hats that I wear. Um, is the executive director of NAMDARC, the National Association for Medical Direction of Respiratory Care. And uh, first of all, let me say that uh, probably as the only non-clinician uh, uh, in the room, my elevator definition of respiratory compromise um, is a little bit different. I refer to it as the downward cascade from respiratory insufficiency to respiratory failure um, uh, to respiratory arrest. I don't know what's... See, this is what happens when you have a non-clinician. There we go. All right, I'm going to not touch that until I have to. Um, in the fall of 2014, uh, Medtronic reached out to uh, Namdark and asked, would you be interested in hosting a conference about respiratory compromise? And my initial response was yes. And then I said, well, what's respiratory compromise? It's a new term, and I'm scurrying. I'm looking it up on the internet as uh, we're chatting, and not much is coming up. But um, uh, after learning a little bit more about it, uh, the whole concept of respiratory compromise, I reached out to our board. And the board agreed that, yes, we would host a conference by invitation only uh, uh, early in 2015. Uh, by invitation only meant that we were going to invite uh, about a dozen medical society uh, to send a representative of their choosing to talk about respiratory uh, compromise from uh, their perspective. Uh, Fascinating conference, what I learned, uh, and it's just been uh, uh, reinforced over the last uh, uh, three years, how siloed and how tunnel visioned uh, so many issues of respiratory compromise actually are. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, for example, uh, Jim Lamberti will look at respiratory compromise in the context of his professional experience. Uh, Jeff Vender, who's going to talk uh, a little later, as an anesthesiologist looks at it very, very differently than a hospitalist would look at it, different from a respiratory therapist. I remember one physician saying that many of the pulmonologists uh, have to deal with respiratory compromise the same way they have to put the fire out after it started. Now we're trying to figure out um, how to uh, uh, inhibit the fire or stop the fire from actually uh, 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 starting. Uh, numerous medical societies, uh, uh, we met in Orlando, and we had a broad uh, support from a device uh, uh, and pharma companies. We allowed them to, we encouraged them to sit in the back of the room. We gave them the opportunity uh, to speak on what they were hearing. As a result of all of that, 
Dr. Lamberti referenced uh, the article in, uh, that's been uh, uh, published in Respiratory Care um, uh, in uh, the spring of 2017. Shortly after that conference, and there were a few NAMDARC members in attendance, uh, the board decided at its meeting the following March, uh, literally two months later, uh, why don't we think about starting a respiratory compromise institute? We engaged Medtronic in those uh, discussions just to get a feel for um, what their thinking was, what our thinking was. The short story is that um, several important housekeeping matters, we wanted to create a separate legal entity. We didn't want the institute to be affiliated with, associated with NAMDARC. So it is a separate legal entity, arm's length, separate uh, tax ID number, files a separate tax return. Um, and in um, uh, the fall of 2015, which is only three years ago, uh, it was established as a 501c3 uh, tax-exempt organization. Uh, in addition uh, to uh, uh, Medtronic, we now have Philips, we have Massimo, we have Fisher Paco, we have uh, Synovian. We're trying to get um, uh, additional corporate partners. All of them have shown significant interest in uh, supporting our um, endeavors. To ensure that uh, a broad cross-section uh, was involved, and again, to clearly signal that this was in no way a, uh, a NAMDARC effort, all clinical decision making by the, by the institute is housed in a clinical advisory committee. It includes representatives from CHEST, ATS, NAMDARC, AARC, SECM, all the usual um, uh, suspects. Also be aware um, that, and I'll use uh, uh, ASA um, uh, uh, as an example. Better yet, let me use uh, SHM, Society for Hospital uh, Medicine. <coughs> we don't get to choose who that person is. The Society for Hospital Medicine gets to choose who that person is. We don't know if that was the first choice or the seventh choice. So it's a pretty eclectic group of individuals um, around the table. In addition to those medical societies, we've got groups like the NBRC, the National Board for Respiratory Care. There are also about a half a dozen to a, <clears throat> about a half a dozen physicians, again, the usual suspects, um, who have voiced interest in the Institute. Neil McIntyre, he's not wearing a society hat. Uh, Barry Make, he's not wearing a society hat. But uh, 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 Sid Brayman, who's going to be speaking a little later, uh, a past president of uh, uh, ACCP. Um, they have shown significant interest, and we didn't want to close the door to them. Just administratively, um, think about having 15, 20, 25 healthcare professionals around the table trying to get consensus um, uh, uh, can be a challenge. Uh, but we're working on it. Um, in 2018, at our meeting in March, there was uh, an interesting discussion that because there, was, um, there were so many challenges in the medical components of our discussion, we decided that we really wanted to focus more on medical education than public education. That's not in place of, but our primary focus right now is in going to AARC, going to SHM, going to ASA, going to all these other societies and try to have sessions like this to talk about respiratory compromise um, uh, to educate uh, their particular uh, members. Uh, uh, real briefly, and we're gonna hear more details a little later, uh, three uh, notable um, uh, research projects already undertaken, uh, two are complete. Uh, the Duke University one, uh, Neil asked me uh, for an extension, and of course my first comment was extension on dollars or extension on time. And of course he said extension on 
uh, time, not on dollars. Uh, so immediately I said, yes, uh, we're fine. Uh, uh, the uh, ECRI review was simply a literature search. We wanted to find out uh, what was in the literature. Respiratory compromise does not appear in the literature in the 1980s, the 1990s. So we had a little bit of a challenge. Uh, we wanted to know what the exact landscape was. Uh, Medicare data mining, and it's important uh, for you to understand when you look at Medicare data, you're looking at claims data. You don't have access to medical records. All you can discern, for example, in this case, is perhaps the presence of respiratory failure. Now, if a physician doesn't actually enter that phrase, that code, into the medical record or into the claim, then we have a challenge. So when we were looking at Medicare data mining, not only did we focus on um, respiratory failure, we went on the presumption that if a physician was billing for mechanical ventilation, that there was a strong likelihood of some level of respiratory failure. And uh, doctors uh, Lamberti and Brayman are going to go into uh, significant uh, uh, detail on that. Abstracts were presented at, uh, at the ATS meeting in uh, uh, 2017. Um, uh, unsolicited, um, the institute received a proposal from uh, Duke University saying that they would do a four-year look back uh, looking at unplanned intubations. Somebody walks in the door, whether it's an emergency situation or a planned hospitalization, unplanned intubations. What happened in that sequence of events after being admitted to the hospital that warranted uh, uh, an intubation? And of course, as we thought about even uh, uh, delving into that research project, one of our first uh, cautionary thoughts was, uh, and Neil didn't like hearing this, just because it happens at Duke doesn't mean it happens uh, elsewhere. So as part of our contract with Duke, we, the Institute, own the research algorithms so that we can replicate that exact same uh, uh, review of uh, uh, medical records, unlike the Medicare data, which is uh, uh, claims-based, as long as uh, we go into an institution uh, that also uses uh, uh, EPIC. We have some preliminary results. I think Neil will uh, uh, hint at them uh, during his, um, his presentation. And we're very excited about um, uh, those opportunities. Uh, we have every reason to believe that uh, uh, Neil will be successful in getting uh, uh, those findings uh, uh, published. And we actually hope to uh, evolve that into a, um, a conference perhaps as early as next June. Uh, significant challenges. Um, we don't know how much of respiratory compromise is actually preventable. Um, uh, a brief sidebar about the uh, uh, Medicare data mining. Uh, we had many, many side bets as to what the primary, the number one diagnosis would be in terms of identifying uh, uh, these respiratory failure uh, mechanical ventilation patients in the Medicare uh, uh, database. And the number one was uh, renal failure. So we don't know if this was end-stage renal disease. They came to the hospital perhaps to die or very close to the end. So it is a, a real challenge to try and determine how much of respiratory compromise is genuinely uh, uh, preventable. High risk versus low risk. If you start saying, well, let's monitor everybody as, as much as Medtronic and Massimo and Phillips uh, may uh, warmly embrace that concept, um, uh, the payers may be a little bit uh, uh, reticent uh, uh, to go down that path. So it's a challenge to identify who are the high-risk patients, who are the low-risk patients, can we identify them? Then you get into the issue of um, hospital engineering, and all I refer, uh, all I mean by that is in hospitals, so much monitoring occurs in the ICU so little monitoring occurs on the patient floors. Do we need to rethink that in the context of thinking about respiratory uh, uh, compromise? Um, what interventions 
uh, uh, are necessary across that broad scope, whether it's pulmonary disease, heart disease, renal disease, all the other uh, factors that uh, uh, Drs. Brayman and Lamberti are going to get into. Um, how much of this is device oriented? How much of it is pharma oriented? Uh, is this a, an area where pharma uh, can play a bigger role? We just don't know. Uh, 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 Dr. Vendor is going to spend uh, some of his time to talking about the relationship between opioids, respiratory failure, and uh, uh, that issue. I've mentioned hospital engineering, education, uh, physicians, uh, clinicians uh, across the board.